Hi, I'm Hallie. I'm an art teacher in an elementary middle school in the Florida Keys. Today I'm going to share with you the techniques that I have put together for assembling collections of student artwork into a hardbound, or at least a hardbound appearing book. <clears throat> You've just looked at some of the samples of books that have been made by uh, some students in some of my classes. This one, for instance, is a collection of student artworks that have been uh, bound together with a cover to look like a hardcover dust jacketed book. The materials required to put student artwork together into book form are not too complicated and not hard to find. One thing that you need, of course, is your collection of student artwork. I personally like to use a square format and I use 7 inch square paper, which is the size that I have my students work with. Cereal boxes, I regularly have students bring empty cereal boxes into the classroom because this is an excellent weight of cardboard and of course the cost of used cereal boxes is just right. You need construction paper, padding cement, which looks very similar in appearance to Elmer's glue. The, your source for that will be any local print shop that can uh, provide that for you, supply it to you. <clears throat> a flat, square-edged paint stirring sticks or pieces of an inexpensive yardstick work very well. Large spring clamps. I use this style because there's a lot of extra space in the back of the clip. And a good stiff easel brush is also um, something that you have right on hand normally in your classroom. Students prepare a cover which is large enough to wrap around their book and have a fairly large end flap which later as you'll see as we go through the pro process gets tucked inside. <clears throat> I laminate the student artwork to give a nice finished quality to the completed book. Just a few words about creating book covers. Of course, uh, having a student draw and letter his or her own original cover art is a great way to go. Sometimes when we're producing quite a lot of them, I use some other techniques to add exciting and interesting color to paper and then add lettering on it. This particular background was created by laying a large piece of paper in a big flat box, dropping large marbles into tempera paint, dropping the painty marbles onto the paper and tilting the box around at random. Gives you very little control over which way the marbles are going to roll, but certainly creates an interesting background and any background of this type can then have lettering superimposed on the front of it to give an attractive book cover. <clears throat> Another technique that the kids really think is cool is blowing bubbles. A small bowl filled with or about half full of water, tempera, and dish liquid detergent. Blow bubbles and drop the paper into the bubble surface creates a very interesting marbled kind of effect. This was done twice, once with the uh, teal color and once with the blue. Another interesting effect that students enjoy doing is dropping a row of paint on each of two sides of a piece of paper and then scraping across it with a ruler to create this plaid look. Any of these backgrounds cut to size and with lettering superimposed on them makes a very attractive cover. Again, summarizing the materials list, you will need the student's individual art, including artwork for the cover, 
empty cereal boxes, construction paper cut to size, padding cement available from a local printing company, flat paint stirring sticks, these are usually given away free at the hardware store, spring clips, and a small stiff easel brush. The first and simplest method of assembling pages to create a book of art is to simply take flat paper, fold it in half, and staple it together along the fold. This can be done very easily with a regular stapler if you are doing a small size book like this one, which is, uh, uses paper that is four inches by eight inches in size, resulting in a four inch square small miniature book. <clears throat> if you use larger paper, you will then need to have a wide mouth stapler to be able to staple into the spine so that you have a smooth result. One of the disadvantages of working with paper that you're folding is the difficulty that students have when they have done one side of the paper and that they're happy with and then they start working on the inside they've got to get two different projects done to their satisfaction and sometimes they mess up and are unhappy with their results so that gets very frustrating for the children another method of binding books is to use the padding method and I have found that the best way to go about that is to make friends with your local printer who can help you out and do large numbers of student books at a time. Now let's go visit my friends at Blue Water Printing who've helped me out over the years with student art projects. Blue Water Printing, which is a printing company near where I live and work. These gentlemen have always been very helpful to me, and when we have a whole class set of books to be padded, you can probably get a local printing company to help you out in the same way, because padding a whole stack at once is neater and a lot easier if they're done professionally. Hi. Thanks for helping me out once again. We're uh, showing my viewers how this operation works. <laughs> First of all, every book that I have prepared to give to Steve has a clip on the side and a little arrow on the front so that, because once again, it's really important to have these padded on the correct side. The procedure that uh, is used is the books get all piled together, and trimmed, just a tiny little trim off of the bound side so that it'll be really, really smooth. This is uh, another little spot where doing it this way makes it just a little better than doing one by one uh, on your own, although that certainly does work. Okay, can we uh, go over to the cutter sure. and Follow see me. how to do it? Okay. The next step is to stack them all up. Notice the arrows are in the right direction and Steve has interleaved them with pieces of chipboard um, to separate one book from the next. And then he gathers up the stack, jogs them to the side that will be cut, slides them into the paper cutter, adjusts it just forward. To trim the edges. And as you can see, the trimmings are very, very fine. Just enough to get a really, really straight, smooth edge. Okay, here's the rest of the pile. Okay, here we are 
over at a contraption called a paddy wagon and the uh, books are all placed very carefully in the paddy wagon and then weighted and clamped down to press them very tightly together. A little bit fancier clamping process than our couple of clips around a ruler. Patty Wagon. <laughs> Gates are open and now those perfect smooth edges are exposed. The padding cement gets brushed evenly onto the edges. And after this dries, then a second coat will be put on. When that's dry, all of the whole set of books can be sliced apart. And they will be ready for the next step, which from here on is the same as if you are doing one book at a time uh, individually. Now that we've seen how a professional printing establishment can put together a large number of student books at once, let's take a look at the techniques that we can use to do one or two books on your own in your own art room. Basically the technique is the same. The first thing that we need to do is have a collection of student projects. As you are working with these papers, it is really important to make sure that all of the sheets are right side up. <clears throat> I like to add a plain white sheet to the bottom of my collection and a plain white sheet to the top of my collection. This white sheet I have already labeled to indicate whose artwork is in this collection. I've prepared a title page, although this is not absolutely essential. It's really kind of nice for students to have some sort of title page for their collection. This one refers to the hurricane that we lived through this past season. I also like to add a bright colored fly leaf both to the bottom of the pile and to the top of the pile. It's really important as you're working with your collection of work to be sure that you keep well in mind which way is up and which way is the left hand opening or the left hand side that you want to have bound. First step is to take this collection and jog them repeatedly onto the table so that you get all of the edges lined up nicely. This is where our cereal boxes come in. Since my pages are seven inches square, I have two pieces of cereal box panel that are also seven inches square and I'm putting one in the front and one in the back of my collection. These are the pages for one book. Double checking to make sure that I have the left hand edge, which is where I want my binding to be. I then sandwich this collection between the flat edges of my paint stirring sticks. Make sure that they are nice and smooth. Then a clip carefully applied to each end whoops, holds holds the collection clipped firmly together. The next step is to take our padding cement and a fairly small stiff easel brush and thoroughly but not too thickly coat all of those raw edges with the padding cement. This is why I use this particular type of clip 
because it gives me room to reach in under the clip and paint all of the edges with the padding cement. Padding cement is water soluble, but it does dry quite firm and rubbery. Therefore, it's really important when you're through coating your edge of your pages with the padding cement to thoroughly clean your brush immediately after using it. We'll be setting this aside to dry, and once it's dry, we'll be adding a second coat of padding cement so that we have a nice firm, thick uh, padding on the spine of our book. All right, once we have our second coat of padding cement thoroughly dry, we're ready to remove the clips and using a sharp kitchen knife, just slice between the layers to remove the paint stirring stick from each side. And then we will also remove the cardboard from each side. And once again, holding the whole collection flat and sliding a sharp knife sideways works uh, very nicely, smoothly and easily. Now we have our collection of student artwork with the fly leaf, title page, and so on, front and back, title page. Our next step then is to take a plain piece of art paper that is the height and twice the width of the book pages. Gently fold it in half. You don't want this particularly creased sharply, but just fold it in half so that you have an indication of exactly your center point. Taking the dry spine of your book you can add, and for this you can use either padding cement or Elmer's. I find with a rather thin book that laying a simple line of glue uh, using the bottle as a spreader works very conveniently. I've used both padding cement and glue for this step in the process and either way seems to work just fine. Once we have it coated well with glue, we are going to press this glued spine directly and carefully onto the fold. And if it wiggles around and gets glue in the wrong place, don't worry about it. But it's easier to work with later if you get it on there nice and straight. Okay. I want to press this paper down carefully to the spine, but notice that I'm not wrapping it around the edges of my pages. For one thing, no matter how carefully this step was done, you're going to have a little bit of glue that beads out along the edge, and you don't want that to uh, glue your outside sheet to your pages. At this point, we'll just stand this up, kind of fanned out so that it doesn't tip over, and set it to one side to dry. Okay, our next step is to fold and create the packages that form the covers of our book. For each book, you will need to have four sheets of construction paper that are as wide or as tall as the page size that you are working with. Since I'm working with a square, all four of my sheets of construction paper will be the same size and shape. If you use a rectangular book format, then your four sheets will not all be the same size. You'll see why as we go along. First, I'll take my square of cereal box, which the format that I'm doing is 7 inches square. 
So I will lay it in the center of a 7 inch by 14 inch piece of cardboard. Carefully fold the paper so that it wraps around the cardboard. What's really important to stress with the students is that you need to have the cardboard pressed very firmly into the first fold before making the second fold. The cardboard needs to be wrapped as tightly as it can possibly be wrapped. And this is why I like to use a paper that is double the width of the cardboard because then I point out to children that you should get the two ends of the, the construction paper as close together as possible. Once the first paper is folded, you'll go right ahead, set it aside, and proceed to fold each of the four pieces of construction paper in the same manner. Wrap it around one end. Make sure it's tightly pushed into the fold so that the other end can be wrapped around and also folded snugly around. Now, <clears throat> if we were using a format that was rectangular, we would fold one color of paper around the width of the cardboard and one color of paper around the height of the cardboard. And that's one thing that you need to keep in mind if you are not using a square format. Which is just another argument for using a square format with the students because all of your paper can be cut to the same size and it's easier to uh, show the children how to produce their packages. Okay, when we have our four pieces of paper folded, the next step is to take color one. And again, since we're working with a square, one versus two doesn't really matter. And lay a piece of color number two. And you can use all the same color if you prefer. But I found with students, if I'm using two different colors, it's easier for them to follow the instructions. We're going to lay this flat on the table. Let's move all of our other distractions out of the way. We're laying this on the, on the table so that the first crease of color two is lined up with the bottom edge of color one, creating a sort of a T formation. We'll take our piece of cardboard and lay it on this top square. Fold the two sides over and now bring the stem of our T forward to wrap it up. Now we have what appears to be very similar to an envelope and we are going to flex the cardboard just enough to be able to tuck that flap inside the way we would tuck in an envelope. And sometimes these tuck in very, very conveniently and nicely for you. And sometimes they'll give you a hard time and just have to sort of work with it and get it tucked in. The more tightly and snugly this package is assembled, the better our finished product is going to look. Okay, we have one package. Notice that no part of the cereal box is actually seen once we get our project assembled. That's what makes cereal boxes work so well, because we don't have to worry about what is printed on them. Okay, let's go through those steps once again so that you can see how this is assembled. Color number one, overlaid by color number two. Then we place our cardboard in the center, fold the sides around, bring the stem of the T forward, pull it up, flex the cardboard and tuck in our flap, creating our second 
cardboard package. Now we're ready to go to our group of pages with its back wing of paper that we glued on. This one is now dry and what we're going to do is press around the square of the spine so that our paper is folded sharply around the spine of the book. Taking the white paper and again flexing our cardboard package, we are simply going to slide this extra piece of paper into the edge of the cardboard package. Notice that when you flex your cardboard package, you have one side that has cardboard and one side that is simply a single sheet of paper. That single sheet of paper should be toward the book pages. Now as you slide your paper in, it has a tendency to catch on the uh, folded down edge of your package and so you may need to reach your hand inside to uh, get it past that little uh, hang up. <clears throat> one package gets slipped onto the front and one package gets slipped onto the back of our page collection and we're just going to slide this on reaching in from the other side to catch that end and get it past the folded in end. Okay, now we have our book completely assembled with one cardboard package on the outside in the front and one in the back. You'll notice that I uh, happen to coordinate the color of the package with the color of the flyleaf, but that is not absolutely necessary to do. Now we're ready to move on to the final step of assembling our book, which is to put the cover onto the book. Starting with my laminated cover, I will decide exactly where I want the front of the cover to fall on my book. Once I decide on that, I will pinch the outside edge, okay, this is where I want the, the leading edge of the cover to fold back. And I just crease this sharply, folding my cover back. Now I'm going to wrap this cover around and slide it into the package right beside that first outer sheet that I slipped in from back here. Okay, push it snugly in, slide it to where the left hand side falls and lifting it up, crease it sharply again, then wrap around to where the back edge of the spine will fall, lift it up, make another sharp crease in the laminated cover, wrap it around to the leading edge of the back cover, and once again pinching where I want this to wrap around, fold it and crease it sharply back, and then tuck this flap in, wrapping around the cardboard in the back. I now have what appears to be a hardbound book with a, a dust jacket, and this is a collection of student art projects in book form. A wonderful souvenir for students or teachers to keep for always. Of course, there are endless variations that you can come up with for expanding on the uses of this particular group of techniques. <clears throat> when you are creating covers, it's not absolutely necessary to laminate the cover, although I 
find that having the cover laminated, and most schools have a laminating machine, um, the, the lamination just makes it a little sturdier and makes it easier to keep clean. Another variation is using the same technique but creating an outside cover. This particular little book was done using sewn together and padded fabric because it is a collection of types of quilt patterns and the basic quilt block is what I use to create the cover of this one. The same system of a package wrapped in either plain paper or a laminated cover paper works just very nicely on an accordion fold book. The only difference is that your laminated piece will become one of the wraparounds on your package and then you just slide it onto the end of your accordion fold book. But this is another way that the same technique can be used. Kids had lots of fun doing this one. Another variation of the accordion fold book uses pop-up techniques and creates a three-dimensional kind of sculptural sort of book. This will be the subject of the next video. But once again, this also uses the folded wrapped package to create the outside cover. And this is kind of fun to produce. I hope everyone who's watching and using this video will have a good time doing it. Lots of fun creating your own collection of books of artwork.